Good morning, Rising Sun. Uh, like Adam said, my name is Trevor Weaker, and me and my wife are here from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, I go to seminary there, and we are a part of a church in Oldham County, Kentucky, called LaGrange Baptist Church. Uh, we miss our church this morning, but we are so glad to be here with you all uh, to study God's Word and to continue in this series on the fruits of the Spirit. As Adam asked me to, to preach and he told me that you all were studying the fruits of the Spirit, I was really eager to choose the fruit of faithfulness because I think faithfulness is the, the center of all that we do as Christians. It's, it's who we're called to be um, and it involves you know, all that we do. But as I prepared to preach the sermon, as I prepared and studied God's word, I must confess that it was, it was pretty humbling because uh, I was reminded that, that faithfulness to God is hard. And faithfulness to God is, is, is something that our self always gets in the way of. But I'm excited to study God's word with you this morning. I love the passage that we'll be looking at. And as we think about faithfulness, I think that in our church circles, it's, it's something that we, we understand quite well. We talk about faith and faithfulness quite often. Uh, but sometimes we, things can become so familiar to us that we forget how important they are. We forget uh, what they really mean. And so when you think about faithfulness, what comes to your mind? For me, I think about my wife. Maybe you think about your spouse. I think about my closest friends, the people that I can count on, the people that are there for me when I need them most, when things are good and when things are bad, and I call them, I know that they're gonna be there for me. Or maybe you think about things that you're faithful to, maybe a sports team that you root for even when they're good and even when you're bad. My dad's a Lions fan. He's grown up a Lions fan. And so you can imagine all the misery that he's been through as he's had to support a team that's not been good in, for quite some time or even products that you buy. Maybe you're faithful uh, to, to Apple products over Android. We are constantly making commitments as people and giving our allegiance up and even sometimes to the most random of things, I'm definitely that type of person. Me and my wife have a, a favorite place that we like to go get ice cream in Louisville called Graders. And every single time that we go, I tell her I'm gonna try something new. And every single time we leave, I get a s'mores milkshake. I can't help um, but, but get a s'mores milkshake. No matter how hard I try, I'm just faithful to it. I've made a, a commitment to that milkshake and I love it. And these things that we're faithful to, whether they're big or small, they impact everything that we do in our lives. They shape the way that we spend our time. They shape the way that we spend our money. They take room, take up room in our hearts and in our minds. And, and this is exactly what our text for today wants to confront us with. What is your greatest motivation in life? How does that determine what you're faithful to? So as we study the fruit of faithfulness, I wanted to take us back to the gospels back to the life of Jesus, to the teachings of Jesus in, in the gospel of Luke chapter nine. We see that Jesus is with his disciples and he gives them a prescription for faithfulness. This is what Jesus requires of all who wish to follow him. In Luke chapter nine though, we're jumping in the middle of a story where a lot is going on. Um, at the very beginning of the chapter, we see Jesus send his uh, apostles out to do the work of the ministry. He commands them to heal people of their diseases and to proclaim that the kingdom of God is at hand and to cast out demons. So they go out into the world and they begin this, uh, this ministry and the whole world starts uh, questioning what they're talking about and questioning who Jesus is. And we see in the next section of chapter nine uh, that the the Roman official Herod gets word that they're preaching this message and, and he has, has questions about who this Jesus person is. He wonders if this is the same message that John the Baptist uh, was preaching. Immediately after this, we see Jesus back with his disciples where he um, performs one of his greatest miracles in feeding 5,000 plus people with five loaves of bread and two fish. And so as you can imagine, all of these things, all of these events and all of these uh, teachings that the disciples are doing are causing a stir in the community and people are wondering, who is this man? And I think that as we come to this text today, that the text wants us uh, to ask this very question. I don't think that it's just a coincidence that Luke chapter nine is packed so full with all of these different events back to back to, to back and all of those things just happened in the first 22 verses of the chapter. 
I think Luke wants us to feel this tension and to wrestle with all that's going on in the text and that he's hoping that we too would question who Jesus is and that it would bring us to a greater and more secure hope and faith in him. And so as we get to where we are today in Luke chapter nine, verse 23 through 27, this is not just a prescription uh, for the apostles as they consider who Jesus is and what it looks like to follow him, but Jesus is confronting us with who he is and what true discipleship and true faithfulness to him looks like. So I'm going to, to read the text for us and then pray, and then we will look at this standard that we get from Jesus on our faithfulness. So if you have your Bibles, open with me to Luke chapter nine, verses 23 through 27. This is God's word. It says, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the son of man be ashamed when he comes in his glory in the glory of the father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we just thank you this morning for your goodness to us. We thank you that as we study God's word and we, and we see what you have to say to us about our faithfulness to you, that we're approaching a text that does not um, just command us to do a list of, of different things, but God, that you have been faithful on our behalf. You have justified us so that we can approach your throne and approach your text with confidence. I pray that you would teach us and that you would help our spirits and our, our hearts to love you and to cherish you. God, convict us of sin and lead us in your righteousness. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So as we look at this, this text, starting in verse 23, the first thing that I want us to see is that our faithfulness to Christ is seen in what we deny. It says, he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, faithfulness to something is typically seen through what we choose and what we love. But in verse 23, Jesus begins by saying that whoever would follow me, if anyone would follow me, let him deny himself. So right off the bat, Jesus is giving a response about faithfulness that we might not expect. And consider the Pharisees and the self-righteous men that Jesus would encounter during his ministry who would come to him and ask him questions like, what must I do? to be saved. Or even in our own world today, we're often so focused on what we need to do to do things like lose weight fast or get rich quick or to develop this or that skill or habit. And we can be so pragmatic at times. But what Jesus gives us here in this prescription for faithfulness is not merely a five-step plan, a quick fix, or a list of basic instructions but he's giving his disciples a challenge for their hearts. He's challenging how worth it they think it is to follow Jesus. As everyone around them is questioning Jesus, he challenges whether or not they can handle all the criticism and all the questioning that comes along with following Jesus. He challenges whether or not they value Christ more than they value their own reputation, their own desires, their own comforts, and even their own lives. But put, your, put yourself in the shoes of the disciples. You're sitting here with Jesus and you, you've given up everything. You've left everything you know behind, your family, your job, all of your comforts. And you've just been following Jesus as he's gone on throughout his ministry. And now he sat you down and he says, if anyone really wants to, to follow me, you'll deny yourself. I think if I was one of the disciples that I might ask Jesus, what are you talking about? We've given up everything to follow you. But Jesus, as he's calling them to deny himself, is getting them to consider their motivation for following him. How greatly do they prize Jesus in their hearts? 
And for us, he wants us to question how much we would give up in order to follow Jesus. Just before this passage, we see Peter rightly confess that Jesus is the coming Messiah that the people were waiting for. But by the end of chapter nine, we see the disciples arguing with Jesus about which one of the disciples Jesus thinks is the greatest. And we are just like this. We're guilty of knowing Christ in our head, but living a life that does not honor him and failing to trust in him. Or even sometimes looking like we follow Christ on the outside, but not giving him our hearts. A few weeks ago, my wife and I had some issues with our apartment. I was home one day for lunch and I uh, looked around the corner into our living room and half of our ceiling was on the floor. Uh, half of our, our, the, the drywall on our ceiling had fallen and uh, I turned around and immediately I freaked out. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure you guys can understand you've probably dealt with some sort of maintenance at some point. But immediately I called my wife and I started making all these plans that we're gonna have to move even before I called my landlord and, and um, tried, to, tried to find a solution. It's like, we're gonna move, we gotta get out of here. I've, I've gotta come up with something uh, for us to do because you know, we've, we've only been married for eight months and I want to, to make sure that we're safe, make sure that we're comfortable. Uh, but it wasn't until a few nights later when I was sitting down with my wife, Drew, for dinner, and uh, I felt really convicted by the fact that I, I didn't trust the Lord, and I didn't go to the Lord um, with this situation before I tried to take it into my own hands. And we talked about how just months before we had prayed that the Lord would provide an apartment for us and the means to, to live where we live and do the things that we do. And rather than trusting in the Lord and asking him to... to uh, take care of something for us as small as household maintenance. Uh, I took things into my own hands. The Bible tells us to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. And instead of reminding myself of that, sometimes I live as if God is unworthy to be trusted with things so small. Or maybe for you and, and for me as well, it can be so easy to become frustrated with the people that we work with, the people that we encounter on social media, uh, the people that we encounter in the world. It's just, we get frustrated easily. It can be easy for us to speak empty words to one another. And it can be really easy for us to resent the hand that we've been dealt rather than to remember the blessings that God has given us. Do we live like we trust in God? Because faithfulness demands that we live for God in spite of our circumstances, trusting that he has all things in his hands. It's like that old song that we all used to sing. He's got the whole world in his hands. Do we live like we really believe that old song? I think even more than wanting to simply correct us in our sins and in our forgetfulness, that Jesus in calling us to deny ourselves is wanting us to see that life in Christ is far more valuable he wants us to see that we were not made for ourselves, but that we were made to glorify God. And so that means that in all things, he must be the motivation for all that we do. Faithfulness to God is, is more than just about obedience to his commands, but it's about living with our hope grounded in God. But this is not natural for us. From the opening pages of the Bible, we see humanity struggling to choose God's ways over their own. As Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and they sacrificed the blessings of God and the opportunity to live in right relationship with him, our hearts are not bent towards God and towards serving God and loving God. Look at what Ephesians chapter two, verses one through three says about how we all once walked. It says this, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our own flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind." All of mankind suffers from worldliness. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. We live according to our own flesh. We make decisions on a whim. We seek to gratify our, our hearts, our own desires. But in Christ calling us to deny ourselves, he calls us to set aside our greatest wants and fleshly urges at whatever the cost 
and to live according to his desires. It's a rejection of our old life, the old life that was driven by the flesh and it's an acceptance of the new life that we found in Christ and living into his holiness. Simply put, it's recognizing that God's ways are infinitely greater than our ways. Do we believe that about God? Do we believe that about ourself, that our ways will never be as good as God's ways and that God's ways are higher than our ways? So we read what scripture says about man, but listen to what scripture says about God in Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55, verse eight and nine says this, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's ways are our best good and they are far greater than our best plans. Our, even our best desires don't come anywhere close to the greatness and the goodness of the ways of God. And faithfulness, as we're seeing in Luke chapter nine, faithfulness requires that we recognize this, we deny ourselves, and we choose the ways of God. We recognize at all times and in all ways that Jesus knows what is best for us and that he is able to be trusted with all things. I think this is why Jesus does not stop at simply telling us to deny ourselves. Look at how verse uh, 23 ends. It says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So as he calls us to deny our, our own ways and our own passions, he calls us to, in exchange, take up his cross, trading in our sinful passions and taking up a cross disowning our old life and taking up the new life that we've been given in the cross of Jesus Christ. He also tells us that taking up our cross is a daily discipline. Now this story is in Matthew and in Mark as well, but in Luke, it's the only one that says, take up his cross daily and follow me. I think Luke wants us to, to recognize that making the decision to follow Christ, yes, is once for all when we come to, the, to come to the cross of Christ for the very first time, but that we must choose each and every day that Jesus' ways are far better than our own. And for those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, we can probably all remember when we came to the cross for the very first time. Maybe uh, there was a time when you were struggling to understand the things of God, or maybe it was years and years of your friends and family faithfully praying that you would come uh, to terms with who God is. But at whatever, uh, at whatever point in your life that it was, at one point or another, you recognize that your greatest need in the whole world is forgiveness from your sin, and that at the cross of Christ was the only solution to our greatest need. God is holy and he's righteous. His ways are far higher than our ways. And in, in submitting your life to Christ, you are made new. God gave you his spirit. You've now been justified before God through faith in Jesus Christ. And now as we seek to live for him, we daily have to subdue our flesh by reminding ourselves of the weakness of our, our, of our flesh, the weakness of our hearts and the greatness of our God. In denying ourselves, we reject that we are our own. And in taking up the cross of Jesus Christ, we rejoice because we are now his. The Christian life is a life called to remembering the gospel and daily trusting in the God who saved us. So as we study the fruits of the spirit, we oftentimes stop at the end of, of Paul's list in Galatians 5, uh, at the end of verse 24, or at the end of verse 23, but I'm gonna read this for us again and I'm gonna read all the way through verse 24. Galatians chapter five, starting in verse 22, it says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. But listen to verse 24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. Verse 24 is reminding us that in Christ, we have crucified our flesh and that in Christ, we daily deny ourselves and take up the cross of Christ. 
the faith, the, those who are faithful to Jesus Christ have a hope that is in God. All they do is shaped by how they can serve God best in all that they do. One of my favorite books is The, the Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. And the main character, his name is Christian, and he represents uh, all of us as Christians. And it, it tells uh, a story of his life as he walks along uh, the path of a Christian. But listen to what the book says as Christian approaches the cross for the very first time. Here's what it says. It says, then was, Christ, then was Christian glad and lightsome. And he said with a merry heart, he has given me rest by his sorrow and life by his death. And then he stood a while to look and to wonder for it was very surprising to him that the sight of the cross should thus ease him of his burden. He looked therefore and looked again, even till the springs that were in his head sent the waters down his cheeks. See, the gaze of the cross eased Christian of his burden to the point that he looked and he looked again. He prized the cross. He recognized its benefits as meeting his greatest needs. And this must be our posture as we seek to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ. We look at the cross and then we look again. We look and we look and we look at the cross until our hearts are filled with such joy at the cross. And we remember that his ways are far greater than our ways. As Jesus continues on in this passage, he tells us that not only is this the life of faithfulness, but that all other ways of living will end in loss. And this is point number two. Faithfulness to Christ results in true life. In these passages, we see Jesus move on from his instruction to deny yourself and to take up the cross daily and into the why behind his instructions. Why must we deny ourselves? Why must we take up our cross and follow Christ? Well, let's look at verse 24. It says, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. And so what Luke is showing us here, what Jesus is telling us here, is he's, he's comparing the, the life of the person who would deny themselves to the person who would save their own life. The one who would deny his life to the one who would save his life. And he warns his followers that if they would desire their own ways and their own passions and their own comforts and their own lives over the life that comes in following Jesus, that they will surely lose their life. And I think for Christians, as we consider the costs, it's really easy for us to say, well, of course we'll deny ourselves and take up our cross. But the temptation to save our life is all around us. I hear sayings all the time like, live your best life now, or do what makes you happy, or follow your own heart. And on the outside, these, seems, these seem like normal, average, pleasant sayings, but at their core, they reject Christ's command to follow him at whatever the cost and to see him as all sufficient, even if it costs us our comfort, even if it costs us our wealth, even if it costs us our safety, that we would go wherever, that we would spend and be spent for the cost of Christ, the cause of Christ. And even in our own lives daily, we face temptation at our workplaces and in our schools and with our friends about whether or not we should stand up for what we know is right, for what God tells us is right, in order to, to maybe save our face or to, to not cause confrontation or in fear that we might lose friends or lose our job. But what Jesus is warning us here is that a life saved in this world is a life lost in the next Verse 26 says this, for whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the son of man be ashamed when he comes in his glory. Our lives are not our own and they will not last, but we often live as if we are responsible for keeping them safe, for keeping them secure, uh, for making them comfortable. And we forget that Christ has offered us eternal safety in the life to come if we are willing to spend and to be spent for his name, for his glory, and for his purposes. And it's not always easy. Jesus doesn't say in this passage that it'll be easy 
but he does say that all else is forfeit in verse 25. There's this, this little book that I have by Charles Spurgeon and it's called No Tears in Heaven. And I love this book. It's a, a compilation of uh, some excerpts from his sermon and uh, essays on just the topic of heaven. And when I'm having a bad day or I uh, am struggling with whatever it is or I'm being tempted even by the things of this world, I often will go and grab this book and I'll sit down and just read what it has to say. It always reminds me how good heaven is and how temporary and fleeting our world is. And I think that this is what Jesus wants us to consider too as we study Luke chapter nine. He wants us to prize the life to come and sacrifice the life that we have now. He wants us to see the value of Christ, Christ and the cross to value uh, eternity in heaven. But listen to a, a brief passage from this book on the emptiness of the world. It says, this world is empty. You know that it is so. And if you know it not as yet, the day is coming when after you have plucked all of its sweets, you shall be pricked with its thorn. And you know that your best estates often bring you great anxiety and that one day you're worried that they might depart from you. You must not be foolish to believe that earthly riches will endure forever. You men of business are frequently led to see that riches take themselves to wings and fly away, but not so for the Christian. He lives in a house that can never hasten to decay. He wears the crown of which glistens and will never be dim. He has happiness that will never depart from him, nor he from it. And he is firmly set like a pillar of marble in the temple of God. And though the world may rock, though the world may sway, the Christian stands secure and immovable in infinite rest. This is what Christ wants us to see This is what Christ wants us to prize as we consider our options, weighing out what is most important in our life. Because this is true life, not a life that's built on earthly desires and pursuit, but life is found in those who deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow Christ for they know that in him is true life. They know that in him, his ways are are greater than our ways. True rest and true happiness is found not in this world, but in the world to come. This world is gonna pass away and Christ has given us security in our salvation in him and in the life to come. So faithfulness is most importantly, it's an issue of what we hope in. And Jesus makes it clear that if our hearts are satisfied in the things of this world, that we will never truly be satisfied. If our hearts long for the things of this world, then we won't have life in the life to come. The Heidelberg Catechism is is this old catechism um, that asks a number of questions and gives answers, but it begins with a question that when we consider what it means to be faithful, I think we all must consider. Question number one of the Heidelberg Catechism says this, What is your only comfort in life and in death? I think many of us and many people in the world would be tempted to say money is our only comfort. Our safety is our greatest comfort. Finding success is our greatest comfort. Having a family may be your greatest comfort. Making other people proud might be your greatest comfort. Other people's approval But here's how the catechism responds. Question one, what is your only comfort in life and death? Here's what it says. My only hope in life and in death is that I am not my own, but that I belong both body and soul, both in life and in death to my faithful savior, Jesus Christ. Is this our hope as we seek to be faithful Christians? Is this the hope that we have that in life and in death that we belong to Christ? This is the hope of the faithful Christian that Jesus is describing here in Luke chapter nine. The faithful Christian denies self, takes up their cross daily and follows Jesus. They deny the old self and hold fast to the new life in Christ because they prize Christ as all sufficient and they recognize that a life that is spent chasing what this world seeks to give us will one day pass away. 
and Christ is our greatest hope. I want to be clear, though, that Jesus is not calling us to be reckless. He's not calling us to be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good, but he's calling us to be faithful stewards because we recognize that all that we have has been given to us by God. He asks us to steward our homes in order to be hospitable to those around us, even when it's not convenient and even when it's not clean. He calls us to love our neighbor as ourselves, even the neighbors that we don't get along with, that have noisy dogs that never stop barking. He calls us to be a voice for the voiceless, to stand up for justice, to honor the orphan and the widow, and to trust in Christ even when your ceiling falls in to never be ashamed of Christ and his word, for in it is the key to life. So the last thing I want us to see is that faithfulness begins in the giving of our hearts to God. And I'm gonna turn, if you have your Bibles, turn really quickly to Proverbs chapter 23. This is a new text, but I challenge you to, we're not gonna spend time in the whole text, but I challenge you this week to spend time reading Proverbs 23 and thinking about what it's asking of us and thinking about what it wants us to consider. Throughout the whole chapter, the writer is writing about how the world is full of things that want to grab our, uh, our attention and win our desires. He even talks about um, the things of the world trying to grab our appetite uh, and our desires and our hearts. <clears throat> But in verse 26, he gives us uh, a solution to our faithfulness. He says in verse 26, my son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. So this writer in verse 26 is pointing us to the cure to all of our temptations and all of the temptations that the world offers. When we consider the fruit of faithfulness, when we're in a situation that feels difficult, that we don't understand, and we don't understand why things aren't going the way that we planned or the, the way that we wanted them to, when we're tempted to sin, let this thought be on our mind. May we be a people that is quick to give our hearts to our heavenly father, though he knows our hearts even better than we do. May we share with him our desires and our thoughts and our doubts and our fears. And let us like Christian gaze upon the cross, observe his goodness, observe that his ways are not our ways and that his, his, his ways are far greater than our ways. His thoughts are not like ours. May we observe his faithfulness and trust in him no matter what life brings. God has loved us so well. Being faithful to him means loving him in all circumstances as we have been loved. God has given himself to us through his son, Christ, Faithfulness to him looks like giving ourselves back to him each and every day. So this leads us to the the final question. How do we know if we're being faithful? I think that a better question for us to consider before we leave today is not how do we know if we're being faithful, but to whom or what are we being faithful to? We are all being faithful to something. There are things that we love most, There are things that shape our hearts and our desires. There are things that we let take up our time and our energy. Those are the things that we're faithful to. What gets the most of your time and your energy? How do you know if you're being faithful? Look to Christ. The Bible says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I think the challenge for us in Luke chapter nine is ensuring that our treasures are not of this world but that we deny ourselves and keep our treasures and our eyes towards heaven. So every moment of our life, every thought of our mind, every desire of our heart, may we not be allured with the things of the world, but may we give Christ our hearts, look upon him, observe his ways. And when our hearts are stirred to love Christ and see heaven and love heaven and value Christ and his benefits, then we will start to live a life of greater faithfulness to him as we deny, him, deny ourselves and carry his cross. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your goodness to us and your grace and your faithfulness to us, even when we are not faithful to you. 
God, we thank you for the ways that you teach us in your word what it looks like to be faithful by giving us examples of people to follow through the example of your son. God, I pray that as we leave this place that we would consider what we love most and that we would go to war with ourselves until the thing that we love most is you and your cross for your ways are not our ways. Your thoughts are not our thoughts. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.